Hey, welcome, folks, and uh, thank you for joining us today. At, uh, we're doing our fire engineering hump day hangout that, that we do on Wednesdays, and uh, I'm, I'm Chief Rick Lasky, and we've got some great guests with us today. I'll, I'll get to them in one second. I um, uh, want to just mention uh, before we forget that if you have any questions, uh, we're going to try and get to them. Uh, sometimes we can get to all of them, sometimes we can't, but uh, don't forget to uh, add hashtag, hashtag FE Talk. Hashtag FE Talk, um, and then post your question, and we'll try to address everything that we can. Um, today we've got we've got some great guests. Obviously, we got the boss, Chief Bobby Halton, with us, um, uh, coming from uh, Penwell International Headquarters in Tulsa, um, which is quite the place, actually. Um, it's you know it, it, it's it's huge. It's actually huge. I get lost in the hallways every damn time I'm there. And it's always when I'm running late to go shoot a, a show with Bobby or do something, I'm running down the wrong hallways. But uh, for for our for our viewers, uh, we've we've got some great guests with us today. Um, we've got Dana Havlick from uh, Amarillo Fire Department, and pretty much I'll, I'll explain they're all from Amarillo. Uh, Dana's a training captain. He's also the Amarillo Professional Firefighters Local uh, 542 president. Um, uh, we've got uh, uh, Dennis. Eves from uh, Amarillo College Fire Academy. He's the coordinator from there. Uh, he's a retired Amarillo Fire Department training captain. He's currently the captain with Randall County, with the Randall County Fire Department here in Texas, but uh, uh, the coordinator for the Fire Academy here at Amarillo College. Uh, we've got Jason Mays, a district chief from, from, from Amarillo. Um, Jason's also uh, an instructor at, at the Fire Academy here, uh, uh, a lot with firefighter safety, among other things. So we've got Jason, Dennis, and Dana, and Bobby, welcome, guys. Good morning. Glad to be here. Um, Glad you to know, be here. Well, and, and I love it. I, you know, I, was, I was honored to be invited to come out to Amarillo and did an evening program of pride and ownership. And we packed the room here. It was great. And got another one tonight. We're going to do a roundtable with the local and with some visitors this afternoon. But uh, I was talking with Bobby early on. What a perfect opportunity um, to, to, you know, obviously to, to bring on some folks that are, are, are intimately involved when it comes to leading the men and women in their department and, and in the area, actually. Uh, uh, they're impact makers uh, with the academy. Uh, it, it's pretty awesome. So I thought, what a great opportunity to, to get everybody together. Bobby, before we go on, um, I know we, we definitely want to mention some stuff. Uh, uh, we, uh, FDIC.com, folks, if you get a chance, zip over to FDIC.com. For, for those of you, and I've said this a bunch of times, check out the, 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 the uh, uh, roll call tips. Um, Incredible thing. I mean, whether it's for the beginning of your shift or if you're a volunteer for your monthly meeting or drill night, you can click on there and and Bobby, there. I think the longest they are is seven, eight, nine, ten minutes. You know, I mean, they're usually three to five yours. minutes. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, yours are the longest. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> but but folks, they they are. They're 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 pretty cool, and it's a great way to step off your meeting or your shift. But uh, Bobby, come on, we got to talk FDIC here real quick. Hey, uh, you know, absolutely, 90 days away, uh, really looking forward to seeing everybody out there. I, I, you know, I, I say this every year, people think I'm kidding, but uh, hot classes sell out. Uh, we've, we've sold out the hot classes the last eight years in a row, um, so, it, and there's some amazing hot classes this year that you really need to take advantage of, uh, and workshops also, you know, uh, workshops by uh, Chief uh, uh, Lasky and Chief Salka, Chief Brunacini, they sell out also. We got a really cool class called uh, Firefighting in the Flow Path by Sean Gray, a hands-on class. Pretty cool, filling up really quickly. It's almost, it's almost sold out. So if you're interested in that one, please jump on it. Of course, there's lots of live fire stuff. You know, first do uh, engine and truck, a uh, great class. Um, Aaron Fields is a uh, um, nozzle forward class. Amazing oh. class. A lot of good technique and stuff in there. So please, please, please register. You know, get yourself set up and, and don't miss out on, on the classes you want to be part of. And the workshops, you know, Danny Majikowski, Stevie Kerber, and the boys are going to be reviewing the data from last year's live fires they did at FDIC. It takes a long time to analyze data. People don't realize that. It's not like you just do it and draw conclusions. It takes time to analyze data. So they're going to do that in one of the classes. And we've got the, Dr. Horn and Dr. Smith and, and Kenny Fent from NIOSH who are going to be, give, for the first time, discussing the research that they've just finished in Champaign, Illinois, 
where they're looking at how particulates can travel through our bunker gear, toxins on the fire ground, and then the cardiovascular effects of structural firefighting and some of the interesting stuff we've discovered recently about how gear actually affects our core temperature and how that contributes to a lot of our cardiovascular issues. So some amazing workshops, a lot of great workshops on how to lead and instruct. Uh, Bob Burns, unbelievable FDNY, one of the greatest leaders in the, in the fire service. Just some amazing stuff in the pre-con alone and, and all the activities, whether it's the Fool's Bash, whether it's Comedy Night with the Cancer folks, the Stop, Drop, Rock and Roll with the NFFF, the 5K Run, just some amazing stuff we, we uh, don't want you to miss out on. So please, you know, get your stuff in early. And then there are 211 classrooms besides the 87 workshops and 25 hands-on training classes. So we've got, we've assembled this year 597 of your favorite instructors. Um, they'll be there at FDIC. Uh, we're anticipating about 33, 34,000 of you to show up and, and hang out, and, and it, it's interesting. You know, people talk about going here or going there for a conference, and I'd like to talk about Amarillo for a minute uh, when I, before I leave, give it back to Ricky, but, um, you know, the thing about when we go, why, why we like to be in India and what people don't understand about India, India has a rich tradition in the fire service to begin with, but when we go there, we own the town, and it's all about firefighting. And it's a chance for folks like us, like, like our friends Jason and Dana and Denny who are on with us today, to feel normal for a change because, you know, uh, my wife always says uh, she, she doesn't like to go out to dinner with me because all I hang, do is hang out with firefighters and all we talk about is firefighting. But when you go to Indy, you don't have to feel weird about it because it's not like you're going to some resort town. You're not going to Vegas. You're not going to, you know, some, some resort town. To, to hang out and take in the, the town, you're, you're, going to, you're going to hang out with like-minded firefighters and talk about firefighting and, 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 and really share and grow and network in ways that you just can't imagine. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the most unique experience in the fire service, and it's got nothing to do with me or, or anybody else. It's, it's, it's about all of us. It's, it's the neatest gathering of like-minded people that I've ever been to. Um, it's just a neat thing. But a little bit about Amarillo for a second. I love Amarillo for, for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, just outside of Amarillo, there's a bunch of uh, Cadillacs that are buried in the ground, which I just think is awesome, <laughs> and, and, and that's so cool to see. And then on the other side of Amarillo, there's a, a, a gentleman who has erected these three gigantic crosses, and he has what we call in, in Catholicism the Stations of the Cross, and it's really just so cool to see such a, a vibrant display of, of, uh, of religion and, and, and how important really just freedom is to this nation. But even beyond that, two of my, and this is the God's honest truth, oh, and by the way, happy birthday to my grandson, Ellis. Um, <laughs> the, the two of my favorite songs of all time are about Amarillo. And one of them is Amarillo by Morning. And, and there's two grid versions of it. One is George Strait, which is awesome. But the other one's by Asleep at the Wheel, which is really awesome. Roy Benson, Asleep at the Wheel. And, and the other song is another Asleep at the Wheel song. I love Asleep at the Wheel. Um, it's called "Am I Right or Amarillo," and it's a it's a gr it's a great great song. So if you if you have uh, whatever uh, my my kid gave me the app for some music thing, if you have one of those music things, go listen to "Amarillo by Morning," one of the greatest country western songs uh, ever written. Second probably only to Poncho and Lefty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, now you're going to have me humming that song, Bobby. We talked about that last night. Amarillo by morning. Broke, broke my leg in Santa Fe. <laughs> well, while, while, we're, while we're visiting on uh, uh, where we're talking about Amarillo, uh, Jason, you want uh, for, our, for our viewers, a little rundown uh, uh, size, the demographics of the Amarillo Fire Department, how many stations and folks you have. Okay, Chief, we have 250 firefighters. Uh, we serve an area of over 200,000 people in our area. And uh, we have 13 fire stations. District, and, dis district chiefs are like battalion chiefs there, right? They're yes, sir. There? Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Pretty busy place. And like I said, beautiful country. And um, uh, Dennis, the, 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 the college uh, obviously has been around for a long time. Uh, a little rundown on the, on the programs you run here, a little, little bragging on on the Amarillo uh, College, especially the Fire Academy. Okay, well, cool. We actually uh, we started running our fire programs in 1994. Uh, we have two academies we do every year. One is a fast-paced 16-week uh, uh, class 
to get guys in and out faster. Then we have one that lasts two semesters. It, it is really good for the person that has to continue working, that has children at home, and so it lets them kind of work through all of that. Uh, we offer a full line of academic classes for the seasoned firefighter that's going toward their associate degree and on to a master's or bachelor's degree after that. So that's kind of where we are with Emerald College. We're very proactive with our local fire department. We have a fire consortium of all the local area fire departments within about a 70 mile, 70 mile area. So. Perfect. We're pretty exciting stuff. I know a uh, great reputation for the area, uh, not just the Amarillo Fire Department, uh, the Amarillo FD has a great reputation, but the, uh, the panhandle, if you will, you know, the whole Amarillo area is, is very highly regarded in the state of Texas. Um, Dana, uh, how, how are the relationships uh, between departments around here, maybe between the associations and so on and so forth? Are they pretty good? Yeah, they're really good, Chief. Um, we, uh, um, here in the last several years, we've really developed a good relationship. We kind of live on an island out here in the middle of the panhandle. Uh, we have, uh, um, you know, basically our, our large department, several smart, small departments around us. So, you know, in order to, uh, you know, you know, things such as mutual aid and stuff like that, we have to have the, and maintain those good relationships and, and, uh, uh, especially in the last several years, we've done a great job with uh, with working closely with those uh, with the departments in our area. Well, and and, and we've talked about last night relationships are key, but you guys um, kind of have the best and the and, and the worst when it comes to weather. Um, I know it gets windy here a lot, but you know I, I've been here before with my buddy John Salka to teach. It was like 116 degrees, like in the shade with the wind blowing, wind gusts like 50 miles an hour, um, and then you could get that, that freak, that gigantic snow thing that will blow through here at the same time. Um, uh, and and Bobby, brought, Bobby, you brought up an interesting thing. U of I, uh, Brad Bone, back when I was, oh, golly, with Bedford Park, Brad Bone with the Institute, uh, right when everybody was pushing from going from three quarters to really going to bunker pants. Um, I remember the commissioner from Chicago came over from his staff. Brad Bone had done an incredible study with all the doctors, uh, I mean, it was unbelievable, and, and, and you were right. What we discovered, um, we've said for years, you know, if you leave your lifeline, if you leave the hose line, um, you end up disoriented and then lost, and we've said it before, being lost and disoriented are two different things. But what we found out through the study, Bobby, if you remember, and, and fire engineering ran the whole series, of course, is firefighters, due to the heat, due to the heat, you know, first of all, being heated up when they get in there, but due to the heat and the turnout gear, which is great stuff and protects us, but we really weren't training our people to our limitations with it. We discovered we had firefighters becoming disoriented on the line. They were becoming, you know, you get, we've all been there. You've been so hot, you're screaming your mask, that they actually become a disoriented on the line and leaving the line. It wasn't that they left it and got lost, became disoriented. But, but Bobby, I mean, you remember the whole series. Brad did a great job, and now they're, they're expanded even further. Um, we're, we're talking about high heat out here, and, and I, I guess I want to look at Bobby for that and then ask the guys from Amarillo what, what measures they take besides, you know, the normal stuff to take care of their people with the heat. But, Bobby, it was incredible stuff that Brad did. It, Brad did, and, and that was followed up by several other great people. Uh, Mifri did a wonderful study on heat stress and, and hydration, which is important for all trainers. I'm sure the guys have, have that on their desktops. And, and then beyond that, we had Dr. Uh, uh, Brown, and Dr. Brown uh, embedded people with the uh, Indianapolis Fire Department, and he also looked at the cardiovascular effects uh, and, and of, of heat stress on firefighters uh, performing actual functions. And then two other great studies, which I just happen to have on my desk here. Um, this is a, a hydration study on, and cardiovascular function that was done by Dr. Denise Smith and, and several other people out of Skidmore. And then this is sudden cardiac events in the fire service again, uh, Dr. Smith and Skidmore and, and several other great researchers, what we know is that when a core temperature rises, that our blood uh, tends to have more uh, coagulants move through it faster. And what that causes is in the existence of any thrombus for cardiovascular effects, in particular uh, sudden cardiac death, um, which we just saw the other day. A uh, very interesting story about a firefighter who actually went to a motor vehicle accident involving his daughter and, and then uh, catastrophically uh, succumbed himself on the fire ground at 46 years of age, which is uh, uh, in, in, in 
to me, young, um, and no cracks, Lasky. But, <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, and I know as trainers, uh, Dennis and Dana and Jason can, can speak to this much more eloquently than I can. It's something we need to be, you know, acutely concerned about. And uh, realizing that, I think one of the things we're going to see, and, and the program that I'm doing this year called Going Down Range, it, it's a, a national program that I'm doing this year, uh, has a lot to do with heat stress. And one of the things we know is that while we remain in our bunker gear, our core temperature remains elevated. We, we, we know that from these studies. And to, to ameliorate that, we need to get out of our gear, which is why I really think that wearing firefighter fatigues uh, when we do training that's non-IDLH, in other words, if we don't have a thermal issue to deal with, we should be doing, just like the military wears their fatigues, when they're not going downrange, you know, they put their battle rattle on when they go into combat, but when they're, when they're not in, in a combat situation, just like when we're not in a combat situation, we should avoid anything that's going to exasper exacerbate cardiovascular issues, because uh, the, what we're finding is it doesn't take... Uh, a lot of pre-existing or anything else to, to exacerbate uh, cardiovascular stress. So if we're serious about firefighter health and wellness, we need to look at the entire context of how and where we do our business, which is why I love talking with people like Dana and, and Dennis and, and Jason. I'll let them talk more about it today because the, the uninitiated or the, square, the people I call the square rooters who really have no experience, real world experience in the fire service don't understand what we're talking about. This audience clearly gets it, but we're being inundated by these square rooters who, you know, take a firefighter one course and then suddenly end up chief of department somewhere or some other insane job uh, where they start calling the shots. And it's what Tommy Brennan warned us about 20 years ago. We, we need men like Dana and Jason and Dennis who've come up through the ranks to continue to lead us because now with this newfound knowledge, uh, we, we've got to change the way we dress. And the Chicago guys kind of were a little bit ahead of the curve. They understood that heat stress element, you know, uh, as, as, as Chief Lasky just pointed out many years earlier. So I'll shut up. Well, and, and real quick, Bobby, because I want to ask um, you know, the guys, you know, what measures they take here because it does get extreme. Um, a lot of people don't realize when it comes to body core temperatures. For, you know, we've all been there, I think, where you've, you've got nauseous, you get the headache, and all that. Well, maybe at home, you're working outside and you, you get carried away and you don't pay attention and you're not giving yourself breaks and drinking the fluids. And Bobby, you mentioned the military. I know your son. I know my son with, with FMF Corps with the Marines. They've always got their camel packs on. They're always drinking water. Whoever invented it. My son said whoever invented those camel packs, those water packs, are, were, is a genius. But what a lot of guys don't get is, you know, you get that headache and you get nauseous. Uh, you get back to the firehouse and it usually takes three, four hours to start feeling better, to really start get rid of, you know, a little bit of the chills, whatever you get. And the reason for that is for every, in general, I don't know how exactly accurate it is, but it used to be uh, described as for every degree your body uh, core temperature goes above normal, it's like 30 to 45 minutes of rehab time. You may feel good on the outside, but, you know, you start feeling like, you know, where your armpits, wherever, where you're closing, you still feel the heat and you're still hot inside. So you know, the whole hydrating beforehand, all that stuff. But um, I guess, you know, Jason, um, you're a shift commander. Uh, I, I mean, I guess to the guys, I know my guys are kind of used to it, but what do you do when, when it's 116 degrees here and blowing, it's like standing in a blast furnace with, with, with the air sometimes. What, what precautions do you take for your people? What, do you, what message do you send out? Well, Chief, as you said, uh, in Amarillo, we have a, every extreme of weather you can imagine. We get extreme cold, extreme heat, and we just try to be proactive and anticipate. If we're on a scene that's a little bit out of our normal element, extreme temperature, you know, if we've got a lot of heat, then we try to call for our rehab unit early. And, you know, in the past, and I'm sure as, especially in your generation when you were riding a truck, we would go off the guy's word and we would take that. Are you okay? Okay, let's get back to work. Change a bottle, get back to work. Now we do, if you get sense of rehab, we have guys that check vitals, make sure that you, you know, they don't just take you at your word. They actually you will know, check your blood pressure, check your body temperature, and just trying to be more pre progressive and really pushing for the guys to stay hydrated. Because if you're thirsty, then you're already dehydrated. So that's kind of where we take it. Well, and there's a lot of guys, we've said it before, I know I had it, where firefighters, when you say you're, you guys ready to come out, negative, five more minutes, ten more, they're not going to quit. Right. And there are some really good, hardworking firefighters that will work until they, 
in, until they, they drop for the most part. You know, they, I mean, they just, you know, uh, I mean, and, and I guess as leaders, we're, we're talking about leadership too, that, you know, I, I was one of those young firefighters, and I saw it in the eyes of some of the young firefighters working for me that they just were thirsty for that, no pun intended, for that work. They want to get in there. They want to keep working. Nobody wants to get sent to rehab. It's kind of, I've almost kind of compared it, guys, to, you know, nowadays we're so much more proactive with mental health awareness and counseling that it's become normal, CISD and so on and so forth, that it should become normal that it's not, it's not a bad thing to go to counseling if you need it or to the EAP or to, you know, to, to have the team come in for a debriefing. It should also be looked at it's not a bad thing to go to rehab. You know, I mean, once you're done working all that stuff, you, you, know, you, know, you know what I'm saying? And, and um, uh, Dennis, you, you know, you retired as a captain. You're, you're captain now. You're teaching at the academy, a coordinator. Um, how important is it? For officers, for company officers, for the leadership to, to, to recognize that with their people. Well, Rick, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I know one of my worst fires with my crew, we fought tooth and nail, tried to go around every way there was not to go to rehab, but we were forced to go to rehab. Uh, in, the, in the long run, it turned out to be great. We were so tired, we'd gone through three SCBA bottles, trying to get people out of the department. So I learned the hard way. That So now I would definitely say a new company officer or new firefighter, for that matter, you know, if you get sent to rehab, go. The fight's not over. It's always going to be there if you need it, but it doesn't do any good if you're fighting yourself and fighting your crew. So definitely go to rehab. Well, and, and Dana, you talked about relationships earlier. Uh, for the longest time, and I don't know if it's changed, we, we had an SOG in Louisville that had a working fire when it was 95 degrees or greater. Forget the heat index. You know, the heat, when it was just baseline 95 degrees or greater, um, a working fire was, was, was uh, bumped up to a second alarm just to get people to come there. I know when I was outside Chicago, um, when we would get like 10, 20 degrees below zero, uh, we did it where same thing. It was, there was nothing better at 3.30 in the morning than to see guys all warm, coming down the street ready to fold up your frozen hose and so on and so forth, you know, they have crews come out and pick up for you. Um, you know, back to those relationships, um, you know, I mean, everybody, you got help coming in besides, I mean, it's built into the system here when, when you exhaust what you've got on duty in Amarillo that you're reaching out around you, right? Well, for the most part, um, we're, we're pretty self-sufficient within the department, but we do try to allow, and we've got some great proactive incident commanders who uh, will recognize those situations early and call for help early, so we'll have plenty of resources on hand. That's something that we've uh, really emphasized uh, recently: is is you know keeping your resources on hand and call for them early and often, and not wait and be reactive and, and be proactive. So you know we're we're doing our best to to emphasize that, make sure we have plenty of help on hand, and if necessary, call you know call outside the department. Although that, that rarely happens for us here locally. Well, and we said it last night in class. We'll say it again tonight. Uh, one of my good buddies, my, men, my mentors, one of my many mentors, uh, Chief Tom Freeman, uh, one, of the, one of the many phrases I grabbed from him was, a good officer, a, a good officer, a good officer, a great officer, one that can predict his or her next alarm. Any mope can stand there on the front lawn in a white helmet and burn to the ground what you got in front of you. But, you know, the fire and the smoke is telling you where it's going and what you need and everything else. Bobby, you brought up, and I know the International Association of Firefighters has been incredible, as well as the Chiefs, with um, uh, what they're doing in, in cancer awareness and prevention. And we finally, it's kind of funny, we finally have the science that we needed to tell people that, keep, you know, you look at rehab and they've got their bunker pants put on, but they're still wearing their hoods or washing your hoods or washing your gear. And uh, we talked about uh, Fort Worth, our good buddy, Deputy Chief Homer Robertson, uh, Fort Worth, and I think Milwaukee at the time, a couple months ago, the only two departments that could totally they could take care of maintenance, inspecting, cleaning their gear, and everything else. Um, they had a they they had a problem not only with guys taking their gear and putting it next to their bed or putting it in their back seat where their family, their kids, their their you know are playing you know that. They also had a bed bug problem where they're bringing bed bugs back to the firehouse, the eggs and the bob and the boots, and then people bringing them home. Homer's actually doing an article for for uh, for Bobby. On that specific, I mean, they, they know that for a fact, and they're actually in the process of looking at two different washers. They, they these are going to mount to their rigs where 
before you leave the scene, whatever scene, where if you may have you know, any bloodborne pathogens on your boots or whatever blood, or just soot, you can you, you kind of back up like you would, you backwards, you put your foot up against this thing and there's either there's he says there's a scrubber with a sprayer or there's just sprayers that before you get back on the rig, you're not bringing all that on the rig with you and back to quarters or whatever. So they're even taking it a step further. But Bobby, it's taken the science to get people to pay attention. You've been an advocate of it as long as I've known you uh, for, for being aware of what, what's going on with what we're breathing and so on and so forth. Well, it, yeah, and it, it's, uh, I appreciate you saying that. It wasn't really me. This is the uh, book that launched the real revolution, if you will. Um, interesting book called In the Mouth of the Dragon. Why Today's Fires Are So Dangerous, and it was written by, a, 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 it says, Toxic Fires in the Age of Plastics. It was written by a dear friend of mine, Dr. Deborah Wallace, a um, lovely, lovely lady, and uh, wrote it in 1989, published it in 1990. <laughs> so 35 years later, and, and it's all science, uh, boys and girls, it's all science. Um, it, 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 and she studies in this book 11 incredible fires. Um, AT&T Fire, the Yonker Brothers Furniture, Ramada Inn, um, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, goes through the whole deal. Um, if you if you want to get a copy of it, go to Amazon Used Books. They'll send it to you from a library, and if you look at the library card inside, you'll realize that it was never checked out. Well, you'll, you'll get a perfect book. Um, so, so it wasn't me; it was it was Dr. Wallace. But today, what we're looking at is even more insidious. Today what we're looking at is the fact that um, because everything's been infused with, uh, as, as, as Dennis and Dana and, and Jason can talk to, everything's been infused with uh, fire retardants. Those fire retardants are toxic. So not only are we fighting the, the, the substances themselves now, but the actual chemicals that they put into uh, things are, are toxic. And what we're learning now through NIOSH's work, and, and uh, my friend Doug, I, I'm blanking on Doug's last name, I think it's Bales, but um, uh, the the nanoparticulates that, that can travel right through our gear. Uh, we don't it, we can't we can't protect ourselves with respiratory. We can't that those toxins th that those are getting into our systems, and so you know the the the, the, the problems are going to continue to evolve. Our knowledge of them is going to continue to evolve. The, the 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 issue for leadership and why I was so grateful for this conversation today is that. We need to model better behavior. It um, doesn't mean we have to change anything. I, I, I hate the word. I hate, there's two kinds of change. There's forced change, which is done by penalties, and it's usually the government doing it. And I'm a libertarian, so I'm not a big fan of the government. But and then and then there's evolutionary change, which is organic and natural. We're not talking about it forcing anybody to do anything. But what we are talking about is taking what we understand to be a threat and a danger to us, and doing everything we can to protect ourselves better from it. So. You know, I'd like to hear what the guys are, you know, doing in, in Amarillo because I, I think Amarillo is an incredible city. It's a, if you haven't been to Amarillo, you're really missing. Uh, you know, put it put it on your bucket list. Well, and, 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 and go ahead, guys. I was going to say, uh, Jason, weren't you talking about um, having somebody out recently? Uh, um, or I, I think one of the past classes or something. We were talking last night about. Uh, um, Having yeah, folks, folks out to do the program. I'm getting. I'm, I'm sorry, getting I didn't have a headset. It's the last minute thing, so I'm getting some sound back. Uh, yes, Chief. We've had two classes that we've had regionally. We had uh, Jeff Dill with the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance come and talk to us about suicide awareness and steps that we can take to address these issues if we notice some in our crew members. Uh, we also had a firefighter come out uh, from the Firefighter Cancer Support Network. And it was, you know, we all know the risk of cancers out there, uh, but that was a surreal class to sit through. I think that was more alarming for me to sit through than the, can than the cancer or the suicide awareness class. And it just, just reminds us of simple steps that we can do to make sure that we go home and we, we do retire from a long career, that we can enjoy the fruits of our hard work. And so those were two classes that we've done lately that, have driven home that message of safety that is obviously very important. And you mentioned Jeff Dill's uh, program. I know Bobby has been huge in getting uh, Jeff uh, involved in, in, in everything and what we need and where we need it. And um, um, 
But uh, like I said, we're talking leadership. We're talking about people um, stepping up and, and taking care of their people for real. A um, couple comments that we're getting uh, on Twitter. Uh, I, I love this, Bobby. This is a great saying. If you guys picked it up uh, on our feed on FE Talk, it was Anthony Correa uh, from New Jersey. With what a great saying. Uh, you should write this on your chalkboard, guys. Write this on your dry erase board uh, and underline it. Rehab isn't to keep you out. It's reconditioning you to, to keep you in the game. It's reconditioning you to keep you in the game. It's not to keep you out. Um, you know, and what a great reminder when it gets hot, you know, come summertime to underline that, uh, you know, when it comes to even wintertime as well. Um, you know, and, and we, you know, another, another, another uh, person jumped on here and, and uh, it looks like envisage, uh, but, you know, firefighters in extreme temperatures require proactive approach. Planning is critical, um, just like uh, we were talking before, but um, I think it comes down to people stepping up and really looking to take care of uh, the people right from the beginning. Dennis, you see brand new firefighters at the academy, right? Yes, sir. What, I mean, this has got to be something you have to be preaching to them. Uh, just with all the evolutions you're putting them through about, you know, being aware uh, before it happens with heat exhaustion and so on and so forth. Well, with, with us, uh, we're out on the pavement, you know, sometimes eight hours a day training. So we make sure that all of our instructors and students both know that it's imperative that you step back and take a break. So we divide into smaller groups and then we'll train one group while the others are out of their turnout gear, while they're getting rehab with Gatorade and water. We have five gallon igloo containers there right on scene wherever we are training. And that way we can monitor each group, uh, how they're doing, while somebody, another group, another structured inside doing training. When we do live fire, it's the same way. We'll have three groups that are actually on the fire ground. The other groups will be standing back, rehabbing, getting ready for their turn to go in. It's kind of a constant rotation. And Dana, for you, um, uh, you, you know the international has been huge. You know, so it's firefighters when it comes to educating the fire service as a whole, uh, when it comes to everything from cancer awareness to health, and, and just, let's just talk health, health and safety. But uh, um, you know, whether it's heat exhaustion or it's the, the you know the carcinogens with our gear and what we're breathing. I was a horrible person with my air pack years ago, and I admitted it in front of an entire group, giving a keynote here in Texas, the Chiefs uh, conference. Um, but the international has been huge, haven't they, with with, with being advocates for us? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the International has always been an advocate for firefighter safety and um, just uh, the, the continuing education that the IFF provides uh, is, is vital to the fire service and it doesn't affect just union professional firefighters, but firefighters across the board. So we can all benefit from, from the research and the studies that are done by the IFF. And on the, on the note too of rehab, one thing that we encounter you know, myself as a training officer, um, recently with, within the past year, we've, we've uh, put two groups of firefighters through a firefighter orientation. Uh, we do a six-week orientation for our new hires. <clears throat> and one of the challenges we face, um, well, during, during those two orientations, we actually did one in the wintertime and one in the summertime. So we experienced the extremes on, on both sides of the weather, extremely cold and extremely hot. And, um, you know, one, one of the challenges is, is, you know, when you have a new firefighter, a, a probationary firefighter whose very job depends on the, uh, the performance that they, that they do, you know, on the fire ground in that orientation type environment, or even later on throughout their probationary year, it's important to empower those firefighters uh, to be able to let the, you know, let you, the instructor, know that, uh, you know, that the, the effects of the weather you know, are, that, that something's affecting you, and, and as an instructor uh, or as a company officer, to, to be able to listen to those as well and not uh, not try to be that uh, fire god, if you will, who is uh, who's trying to show, you know, how tough you are, but to know that you know, we have, uh, we, we all have the weaknesses and we all have our limitations, to be able to recognize those from both sides, to be able to communicate those effectively, I think goes a long way. And like I said, it, it's difficult when you're a probationary firefighter and, and trying to communicate that to the, uh, you know, to the training captain or the training chief, um, you know, in the course of an evolution 
you know, on which your very job seems to depend on your performance. Well, and, and especially a young firefighter, like you say, is trying to, if you will, prove themselves as well too that they're, you know, that they're worthy of, you know, the trust of their officers and you know to be part of that organization. That sometimes they can go a little bit overboard. Hey, hey, folks, we just passed our to our to our viewers. We just passed the halfway mark here of today's Hump Day Hangout. And, and if you just joined us, um, just a quick review. Uh, we're visiting with Chief Bobby Halton today, the boss. Uh, uh, we've got Dana Havlick uh, from Amarillo, from the Amarillo Fire Department. He's a training captain there. He's also uh, the local 542 president and an academy uh, instructor at the Amarillo College. Uh, we've got Dennis Eves, who's retired captain, uh, training captain from Amarillo and a captain with Randall County Fire Department here in Texas. And he's the coordinator for the Fire Academy at uh, Amarillo College, a great college. And we've got Jason Mays, a district chief from Amarillo, who's also an academy instructor. And we're talking leadership, safety, and everything else. Uh, but Bobby, I, I, I meant to ask you this before, and I just checked my notes. You held a couple books up that people obviously could staff shock as we play this. Go, you go to fire training. I mean, let me, where would one of our viewers, what's the best means? Is it just go to fireengineering.com and type in the search engine, you know, heat, stress, or cancer, or where, what would give them the, what advice would you give some of our viewers, the best advice for them to grab stuff from fire engineering? Uh, and fire rescue, but you know, you know what I'm saying? If I wanted resources on cancer awareness and we'll talk heat stress as well. Great question. Um, if, if you put put in, a, in, if you go to fire engineering and you just go to that little search bar, when you put, when you put in a, a question like that, uh, what you'll get, one of our most recent, and, and I like, this This is a wonderful book and what, why, why this is such a wonderful book is it, um, it, it, it starts you down the road um, on two issues, fire behavior and uh, toxicity. And what's neat about this book is it, it has a historical perspective um, which gets you aware of many fires in which this came into play. Also, what's critical as, as our, our, you know, Jason and, and Dan and Dennis were talking about is what do we know today? And so we published an article, oh, I'm going to say, I'm probably going to lie to you, i got to look at what month because I'm always a couple of months ahead. Um, I'm trying to remember what month it was. I believe it was November. Um, again, it was the most recent uh, research that we have on the cardiovascular. So if you if you put it in there and put push in Denise Smith or uh, Kenny Fent, um, it, it should come up. And I'm, I'm I'm pouring through my mags right here to see if I can find it. But um, I apologize. I'm old and I forget a lot. Um, you know, sometimes oh, I walk out and I realize I'm in my in my tidy whiteies getting in the car to go to work. <laughs> but um, you know, like the mad scientist. But if you just if you put in um, you know cancer awareness or cardiovascular and firefighting, you'll get Denise's most recent article um, that her and Gavin uh, Horn uh, and uh, and Kenny Fent from NIOSH were kind enough. And Kenny actually has another article in there that Kenny wrote um, about a concurrent study that's going on in Australia. So if you put in Kenny Fent, F-E-N-T, you'll get uh, Kenny's most recent article that he wrote along with some of our good friends from Australia who are also working concurrently on some of these issues with us um, uh, on uh, toxicity, heat stress, and, and gear. And uh, if you put in Denise Smith, D-E-N-I-S-E -E Smith, uh, you'll pull up her most recent stuff in fire engineering. So one of the things we try to do, and, and I think uh, as the guys will say, is that you know you, you always... You have to be careful about fighting yesterday's fires, or, or as they say in the military, yesterday's wars. You know, you always want to be fighting today's today's fires, today's wars, today's uh, issues. And there's a lot of information out there. Uh, what you have to be careful about in, in, uh, is, is to let the situation evolve. In other words, uh, be careful about the folks that, and, and I'd like to hear what the guys think about this, uh, the, the, the ready, fire, aim people. You know, who who get one piece of information and go nuts. You know, I, I remember right after the uh, vertical ventilation study came out a few years back, um, where people started going around saying, "Well, they're they're saying we should never vertically ventilate." That that nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, this remember uh, Francis Bacon said it best, and I'm gonna butcher this quote. Um, he said that um, scientists are men of of numbers and data. Um, and, and, they, and they compile them. The reasoners 
are people who are like spiders, and and they take stuff with their own web and and put a put a, a spin to it, make a web out of it. But bees go and through their own industry go to flower to flower to flower, and then from that industry and from taking from the flowers, then they go on to make honey. So firefighters need to be more like like bees. That's uh, probably a pretty far out there metaphor for a conversation, <laughs> but. Um, I apologize, but I love Sir Francis Bacon. If you want a brilliant guy, but um, anyway, that, that that's where uh, I think we need to be. In other words, you're going to have the researchers, and their jobs to shed light, not to master. The, the mastery comes from people like Jason and Dana and Dennis and the rest of us that are out in the field practicing. The 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 the, the researchers should shed light. Unfortunately, you have these spiders in between these reasoners who start to go all over the place and and and, and create these webs. We need to be like bees. You know, you, you take the existing stuff that you know and that you can garner from, and the many different uh, uh, flowers that pollinate, and, and then create this incredible, incredibly powerful product we call firefighting. And so, um, at least that's how my mind works. Um, does that make sense? Well, absolutely. I guess what what I want to ask the, the guys, and maybe I'll throw this one to Dana. Um, Again, switching gears a little bit, let's let's talk leadership regarding the health and safety of our firefighters again. Um, how important is it for, for you to stress this to your officers to have, we've talked about that talk, the talk you should be having with your new firefighters. Um, we're not in a popularity contest. I, you know, good buddy of mine said, I'd rather, be, I'd rather be respected than liked as a boss, liked as a bonus. Um, sometimes if you truly care about your people, it means making decisions and given orders that they may not think are in a way as much fun, but it's for their own benefit. Um, Dana, you're, you're the training captain. How important is it to emphasize? I mean, isn't is all about change and getting people to realize it's this? It's not the same thing. It's not the same. The fire hasn't changed. What we're burning has, and what we're seeing as a result of it is pretty dangerous, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I, I think uh, you know, it, firefighters are constantly resistant to change. We all know that. So, you know, you know what, what we've done here in Amarillo is try to emphasize the science behind why we should change. Um, and, you know, some of the NIST, UL studies and the like, and, and bringing those into play. And, and modeling the behavior is another thing, too. Um, you know, uh, we, we can give orders all day long to order you to do something, but if we don't model that behavior and, and show you know that, that we as leaders of the fire department are, are doing the things that we're we're advocating that our firefighters do then you know basically we're just we're spinning our wheels and we're not doing anything so you know it's important to me as a training officer to to model the behavior to emphasize uh, the the science behind give the why um, you know uh, we top A personalities a lot of times we like to know how things work if you understand how something works why we're doing something, certain things, instead of just saying do it, then I think that that helps in the long run. And and you know these these new firefighters coming on board, if if we if we can change that culture, then then over time, over the next five to ten to fifteen to twenty years, then then we've we've changed that behavior. So we have to work it from both ends. Well, and and you know, and I was going to ask Dennis this 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 question a little while back where. We've been doing this a long time in the fire service, and we're talking about change and how hard it is to get people to change. And it's absolutely a fact that, you know, what we're burning has changed. We mentioned last night, you know, you're sitting in, on frozen gasoline and the byproducts, and you know what we're looking at. Uh, I was a very poor example for a long time uh, of SCBA use, um, uh, and it wasn't anything, I wasn't trying to prove anything as much as it was just a bad habit. It wasn't even complacency, which is, like I've said before, complacency is just a fancy word for laziness. It was a very bad habit that I, that I, I formed working around people that weren't very proactive. And a lot of them are gone now. A lot of them are fighting cancer and so on and so forth. But when it, when it comes to doing the right thing and taking care of your people, um, Dennis, it's got to start back at the academy with those young firefighters, right? Sure it does. One of the... The thing that I think is, is most important for the young person to understand is we give them a tool bag. We tell them, take your tool bag with you wherever you go. And that's all the tips that 
uh, that were given them to help fight fire, how to get along at the fire station and so forth. But one of those things we put in the tool bag is how to stay safe yourself uh, and so forth. But I like to tell them to uh, prepare for the future. And I don't mean like your first day on the job. I mean like as an, an old seasoned firefighter, we learned that one of the things that we do as we get older, we start going to more and more firefighter futures, funerals, the people that we work with when we were started, the people that uh, over the years didn't wear SCBAs, the people that left their turnout coats wide open or didn't even have them on, they didn't wear but day boots. And so we've learned through their mistakes how to protect ourselves. But I want new guys to understand that that protection starts the day you walk on the job. You protect yourself, you protect your family, your friends from the day you go to work. You don't wait until you've been on the job 30 years and say, man, I wish I'd have done this. And we see all the cancer uh, survival rates and the people that are having cancer on the fire department, how huge that percentage is nowadays. But, you know, some of us, that may not, it may already happen. We just don't know it yet. But for the young guys, we don't want that to happen. So we, we really preach to them and instruct them and try to get it into their brain that wearing their PPE all the time, all the time is what matters. Well, and, and again, it, it, it's, it's affecting change from the very beginning. Um, Bobby, um, years ago, like in the 80s, there was, and I'm, I'm trying, I, I probably can't quote it exact, but back then there was, um, we were in a class and... Um, they brought up the fact, I think the statistic was that like um, the majority of the firefighters that retire collect about 18 months worth of paychecks. And I was, I'm sitting, I was, I'm a younger firefighter, I'm like, you're out of your mind, 18 months, you know what I'm saying? And then I went back and I started noticing that as soon as this guy retired, six months later he's got cancer. As soon as this one, it was like, and, and I know, again, a lot of smokers, a lot of poor habits, a lot of not wearing air packs, but... You brought something up before that I've said for years. Look at the ages. They, this whole 49 to 51 percent heart attack and stress. You and I have talked about it. That we don't. A lot of people admit that some of that is hydrogen cyanide, not wearing the face piece at the beginning or during overhaul, and not getting that tested quick enough. But at, at, at the same time, um, it, it's not. It's not the same as it was in. Uh, the, the, we've got younger and younger firefighters, and I'm, ta I'm not talking. That maybe have a you know big maybe weight problem or whatever, uh, some without even any cardiac history in the family. You just said earlier, Bobby, these are young guys that are dropping, and you know it's not you know I mean there's the 82 year old that was directing traffic at the exit last night. The next morning he passes away, but we're seeing younger and younger firefighters. Yeah, and and. I don't know statistically. It, one of the problems with the American Fire Service is we didn't really start keeping statistics until 1974, which is interesting. But if you look at uh, our statistics, the other thing we don't do a good job at is tracking retirees. So uh, a lot of what was said back in the day was anecdotal. People would say the average firefighter only lives X number of years. I can't speak to whether or not that is factual or not, but we, but you, you do see uh, you know folks on this job passing away. I, I did do an in-depth study, uh, you know, non, non-diagnostic, but, you know, the non-longitudinal, I mean, I, very thorough, and I looked at the human condition, and the one thing I did discover is that everybody does die, um, oftentimes at varying rates and times, so a lot of it has to do with your genetic makeup, you know, good genes, bad genes. Um, I had a, I had a, a, my wife had a grandfather, rather, who died at 94, who smoked two packs a day chain smoked. My pop died at 55, uh, you know, from cancer. So, uh, you know, it, life is a funny thing. It was never meant to be fair. But we do know that our our cancer rates are exacerbated. You know, you talk to Brian Peters and Timmy Elliott from Firefighter Cancer Support Network. They keep great data. Our cancer numbers are much higher than the general population, which contributes to our earlier demise. Our, our stress rates are much higher than the general population. Again, contributes to our earlier demise. So, I think as the data comes in, we'll be able to have a better case to present. But um, I think I think you know not, not to be a contrarian, but I think that the the fire service is tremendously pliable. I think the firefighters 
uh, aren't given enough credit for how much we do embrace change and how willingly we do change. You know, we came in in the day as three-quarter boots, no air packs. Now we got thermal imaging cameras. We all wear fully encapsulated gear. Uh, no one has a beef with it. The incident command system revolutionized not only how we do business, but law enforcement, public safety in general. We stole that from the military. You know, paramedicine, you know, uh, hazmat, high tangle rescue. A lot of that came on the last few years since since I've been around and continues to evolve and, 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 and grow. And firefighters embrace that. They love it. They're they're all about it. I think we talk about leadership. There's a couple of the, the but the best thing that was ever said to me about leadership came to me from one of my sons, and and I love my sons. I, I hope someday to be half the man that they deserve as a dad. But one of my boys, Lieutenant Commander Dean Halton, call sign drama, said that in a profession like firefighting or the military, where command is given, command is given by virtue of your of your of your promotion, your rank, the the, the legal responsibility of a firefighter or a fire officer, command is given. But respected leadership is, 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 is something we strive for, respected leadership. He said there's three things that are necessary and two are critical. He said first you need to be a good officer. You need to understand what your people are going through, what their day-to-day -day life is, and, and the nuances of their tasks and the complexity and the difficulties that they have to put up with. He said the second thing is, and he was talking about pilots, you have to be a good pilot. Otherwise, you'll be dead, so the arguments move. He said the and the same thing could be said for firefighting. He said the third thing is, be a good dude. And if I have to explain that to you, then I can't help you. And, and I've always remembered that quote. That was from my kid. And, and I think that, that that goes to what we're talking about here when we talk about leadership. And oh, and here's the, the correct quote for Sir Francis Bacon. I looked it up. <laughs> Sir Francis Bacon said, the men of experiment are like the ant. They only collect and use. The reasoners resemble spiders who make cobwebs out of their own substance. But the bee takes the middle course. It gathers materials from the flowers of the garden and the field and transforms and digests it by a power of their own. By a power of, that's what firefighters do. Well, and, and Bobby, you and I have talked about it. And guys, you've seen it before where um, uh, you know, one of the things we've talked about is, you know, there may be some resistance, resistance to change by certain firefighters. I did that blog a while back for you, Bobby, on Firefighter Nation, 150 years of tradition on a by progress, the ultimate insult. And a lot of people didn't read the whole thing where I'm very partial to that. My wife was in that movie, Backdraft. My my best friend and my, at the time, you know, he passed away, unfortunately. And my best man at my wedding, Ray Hoffs, one of the two real Backdraft brothers. And I learned that uh, Chicago is one of the most progressive fire departments I know. Um, don't confuse, you know, a little resistance because we've been fooled before with some, you know, firefighters sometimes say, okay, you, you got to have to show me a couple times before I jump on board. But I agree with you, Bobby. The fire service is, is always, I, th I think there's some of the most proactive people anywhere. Look at our apparatus, look at paramedicine, look at, you said it, all the specialty skills you have to have. Um, you know, I, I absolutely do think that, it, that they're proactive in, in that way. I agree 100%. Um, we're getting uh, we're closing in on time here uh, with 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 our with our folks to our listeners and want to take this opportunity. We've been talking, golly, you know, some great stuff on health and safety and 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 on relationships and on leadership and taking care of your people for real. Um, let's uh, let's throw a little spin, uh, guys. Uh, uh, Bobby and I try to do this in our classes and our radio shows, and especially on a hump day hangout. Is um, let's let's shoot to uh, to, to uh, Dennis. Um, uh, I guess it'd be what, what advice as we're wrapping things up here what advice would you or do you give those brand new firefighters what would you if you had them sitting in front of you right now you know you get up and walk away what, what would you tell them I think the main thing is is control your own destiny if you want to be a firefighter and you want to do a good job as a firefighter control your destiny get out there use your tool bag Learn everything you can, but find you a mentor, whether it's a senior husband, whether it's a junior officer or a captain or whoever. Find you someone that you can relate to, hang on to them, learn from them, and continue on with your career. But the main thing is just never stop learning the job. It, it never stops. It, you can be in the job for 50 years and you never stop learning. And that's what I'd say. Just control your own destiny. 
Well, look how long you, you, you know, you've been doing it. You, you know, retired from Amarillo, and not, now you're captain of another department, and you're the academy coordinator and, and molding uh, the future of the fire service. Uh, I always, and this is not a, a plug because Bobby's sitting there. He knows I have this on uh, several of my PowerPoint slides, uh, you know, about telling young firefighters, any firefighter, to make Fire Engineering Magazine your morning newspaper. You know, if you don't have the app on your phone or any of the apps, you know, what are you reading? Every day they will send you information throughout the day and, you know, great information uh, on how to stay current and, and what to do and, and how to do that. But, Dennis, real quick, before we uh, move on to, 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 to one of our other guests, um, if somebody want to get a hold of you, talk college programs, uh, anything you brought up, or what's the best means? An email, best means for them to get a hold of you? Yes, sir. Email great. It's D-S-E-V-E-S. -E 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 at actx.edu. Okay, perfect, folks. So there you go. Um, Dana, uh, our, our training captain and, and, and our, our union president, and, and thanks for, uh, I always I always want to thank uh, our, our local presidents for stepping up and, and uh, looking after the benefits and the health and safety of their membership and that. But um, training captain, what advice do you, uh, what advice do you give to, um, uh, those firefighters and those officers from your position. They will keep them healthy and safe or whatever. What advice would you give? Well, I, uh, kind of going back to advice to new firefighters, uh, my, my son is a new firefighter, so I think about this uh, often and um, kind of echo some of the things that Dennis said as well, is that uh, never stop learning your job. Um, always be a student of your profession and, and, and just keep learning. And, and Echo what you said earlier. I told my son the exact same thing. Uh, whenever possible, pick up those publications that deal with your job. Um, you know, you may be studying for you know different things throughout your shift. You know, when you have a couple of minutes and you get tired of studying your SOGs and SOPs, pick up the fire engineering magazine and read and learn uh, from the examples of others, whether they be good or bad. And uh, and and just just always be a student of your profession. Well, and there's no reason to not be nowadays. I mean, you know, with the Internet, like I said, if you don't have, you know, the Fire Engineering app on your phone, the FDIC app, the Fire Apparatus Magazine app, if you don't have the Fire, you know, the Firefighter Nation app, if you don't have any of this stuff, and I'm not just pushing pen. Well, there's incredible things coming out of the IFF and the iChiefs and so on and so forth, but there's, there's no excuse anymore to not stay current. So you're, you're exactly right. So, Dana, again, same thing with you. If, if someone wanted to get a hold of you and, and, and pick your Rain a little bit, ask for some advice, or get some information. What's the best method? Sure, absolutely. They can uh, contact me by email. My email address is local542president at gmail.com. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, brother. And, and Jason, 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 district chief, battalion chief, you're, you're talking. Let's, let's turn this. Uh, you've got a uh, new company officer sitting in front of you. Um, you know, just assigned or whatever, came over from another ship, got promoted to, you know, you have that chance over a cup of coffee or a glass of tea. What, what, give us the talk. What would you say to them? Two things, Chief. Uh, Captain Joe Neely, a uh, captain with Amarillo Fire Department, told me the concept that stuck with me over the years. Work to have a great attitude and always keep a good work ethic. A guy that has that and embraces that will go far and can generally accomplish anything. And lastly, stay humble. Uh, whether you're promoting, whether you're new on the job, you can have the best ideas. You can be the smartest guy in any room you walk into and sabotage it all with arrogance. So stay humble. Perfect. Great, great, great. And if they want to get a hold of you, Jason, how, what's the best means? Email? Jason.Mays, M-A-Y-S, at Amarillo.gov. Perfect, perfect. Well, thanks, guys. Bobby, uh, you know, I always lean on you. Um, uh, you you've been a, a great friend to me and, and a mentor. Um, uh, you know, Bobby, we're, we're closing things up here. We talked about FDIC. Um, we've, we've talked about uh, uh, a variety of things. Um, uh, you want to finish us off with uh, some some advice? Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, the three guests we had on today are really inspirational, and I think that, that you know, we, we talk about leadership a lot, and I think it's important that people recognize that um, we're all leading uh, somewhere, someone, somehow. It's just a question of whether or not you're doing it well or poorly. And when we have great examples like Jason and Dana and Dennis, I think it's important that people just take a minute and recognize them and, and, and emulate some of those qualities. And, and remember, as I, I believe was uh, 
Dennis said, you, you are in control of your own destiny and, and who you're going to become. And, and I think that um, besides fire magazines and, and fire stuff, read everything you can. Education is a lifelong process. Uh, the, the, it's interesting, I'm trying to remember, um, believe it I believe it was Einstein. I'm, I'm trying to remember who it was. I, I believe it was either Einstein or, or one of the other great intellects of the 20th century. Uh, no, it was Churchill. It was Churchill. I'm sorry, it was Churchill. His dying words were, I'm done. I'm done. Learning. That's what he meant. And, and that was the end. He passed away. Well, we've had a... Uh a great hour here, folks. Uh, I, I can't thank uh, uh, our, our brothers from Amarillo for, for, for coming out with us, guys. You were awesome. Um, and uh, what a great message. Um, a lot of passion, uh, a lot from the heart. Um, absolutely incredible. So, so, folks, thank you so much. To our listeners, thank you for our, vi our viewers uh, for, for joining us. Uh, join us every Wednesday. Uh, you got different hosts, uh, some great people doing some great things at Hump Day Hangout. Zip over to FDIC.com, uh, get signed up for FDIC, get to FDIC, or watch it. If you can't make it there that year, look for the live broadcast, the live streaming coming from FDIC. Watch uh, some of the keynotes and some of the activities. Um, grab the magazine, load the apps on your phone, uh, get the, the you know the roll call tips and start using with your people. And as always, uh, uh, stay current and, and uh, just take care of your people. It's all about leadership. Uh, again, as we close things out here, uh, you know, we want you to keep our, our the men and women in armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. Um, you know, everybody in law enforcement that's that's going through some challenges right now, and and uh, everybody within the fire service. So, uh, with that, as we're wrapping things up, again, we never end any of our shows, any of our programs without two very important words, uh, and that's be safe. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>